Today we're talking about the justice of God, or another way of thinking of it is his fairness, his equity. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 4 says, The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. We see this also in, in the law where God says, you shall have just or fair scales and balances and measures when dealing in, in your business and dealing with people, and false weights are an abomination. In Proverbs uh, chapter 16, verse 11, it says, A just balance and scales belong to the Lord. All the weights of the bag are His concern. So, having a just balance is reflective of God's character. And so, Him saying unjust scales, unjust balances are an abomination, is because it it is a false reflection of who He is. He is just. He is fair. He will do right. So, if someone is cheating the person that they are selling to, then they are uh, not being fair or just in their business dealings, and they are dishonoring their God. And so, God himself, as he deals with man, and if with creation, is fair, is right. This is uh, closely tied to the study or um, handling of God's righteousness, and is often handled under the same heading in systematic theologies. Um, but we took it separate today because there is a little distinction here about God's uh, fairness to man, in that he does things right, um, and righteously and holy, but he is, he is fair. And I think it's, a, it's, it's important to, to talk about that distinction or talk about this um, slice of God's character separately, because that is often one of the things that is thrown against God, as if he's not fair, as uh, why, do good, why do bad things happen to good people, and questions like that are asked of God as if he is ask, as if he's acting unfairly. Um, does God uh, know the age of this victim? Does God realize the suffering that this person has already been through, and he allows further suffering? And so... We often, m most of the time, will not understand uh, or be able to quantify God's fairness or God's will in many things, in most things. So when we see suffering in our life or in the lives of others, it's tempting for us to say, there's no way that this is fair. That if God was fair or just, then this wouldn't happen. But the problem is that we don't, see things comprehensively as God does. We cannot see the end from the beginning as he does. Uh, years and decades and millennia he has within his sight right now. So scripturally what's left to us is to trust him, is to look at his character, to look at the history of how he's dealt with his people. I think that's key, as we talk about many times. How has he dealt with his people, one, Two, what are his promises to us? And three, what is his character? And is it such that we can have confidence in his word in keeping his promises? That we can believe that he has been good to his people and will be good to his people. That he will keep his promises. And I think if we look at scripture and the grace of God, especially as it's revealed in the gospel, if we look at the gospel we can be confident that the answer to, is, to those questions is yes, he will be faithful to keep his promises. His character is such that he is um, a man, of, a God of his word, let's say. And Jesus is a man of his word when he promised us um, eternal life and the good things um, in salvation. When he promised himself and fellowship with him. So when we think about God's justice, um, we can think of really three three things that are in, in that. And one is that, or the foundational thing to think of, is that God is a just lawgiver of a just law. So, as we see in the Old Testament, as we look in the world, God is not dealing with the world as a just lawgiver without a just law, or with an unjust law, that he is in every way just. There is no area of 
creation in which God is unjust, because that would be a lie, because he himself is just, and so he will act justly always. So what comes out of that, if he is a just lawgiver giving a just law, then for him to be just in dealing with lawbreakers and law keepers in this world, he has to be just in his rewards and or punishments. And so for those who keep the law, who are obedient and um, perform their humanness in the way in which they were designed to, so to glorify God and to um, worship and serve Him rather than the created, uh, to be what they were made to be, then God deals with them uh, rightly. He, deal, he, deal, he gives rewards and He gives blessings. As it says, He's close to the righteous. He delights in the righteous. And if somebody is a lawbreaker, then God is just in that He inflicts punishment that is... Um, that corresponds to the uh, offense. Um, so uh, God is not going to give an unfair or unjust punishment out of proportion to what it is. I mean, as we see that we see that in the law. But as the Scripture says, we are all lawbreakers, all lawbreakers, all mankind. We we have all broken the law. We have all turned aside. We have no interest in worshiping and serving the Creator or rather than the created. That is in all of us. Our hearts are um, idle factories, as John Calvin says. But God made a way for his justice to be satisfied while at the same time show grace. And that's an amazing thing. Where if we're not careful, we'll, we'll think of the gospel as a as an exception to God's justice. It's not. The reason it's not is because, as it's, as we see in Romans chapter 3, verse 25 and 26, uh, God provides the payment or the propitiation for his wrath. The just payment, the just punishment for sin, for the sins of mankind, to go to fall on his son, who he provided. It says he displayed publicly Jesus as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration I save is righteousness at the present time, so that you would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So he remains just, while at the same time he justifies. If he were not to require payment for our sin, he would be an unjust judge. But he required payment, and he submitted payment in the form of his son Jesus Christ on the cross. So God's justice and grace meet at the cross. What a beautiful picture that is. So that's one way in which we can take comfort. If we look at the gospel, God remains just, but he has made a way to preserve his justice while at the same time showing grace to those who are justly condemned eternally. But through his son has made a way to be reconciled to him, to have the payment for their sin fall on Christ his perfect righteousness imputed to them. So they are in relationship with the Father as if they had lived a perfect life under the law because Christ's righteousness is given to them and they are redeemed in the blood of Christ. Another way that this can be comforting is the truth, if God is justice, if God is just and he will act justly, the evil will not go unpunished. And so... When we look at the world and we see rampant evil, we see rampant um, sinning against uh, people sinning against each other um, in dark ways. Uh, we see it in the news, um, and we think, "How is this fair that these evil people are blessed with all these things in life, and they're never brought to justice in this world? God will punish them." Isaiah eleven. Verses 3 and 4, this is a prophecy of Christ when he comes at the end. He, that is Christ, will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor, and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. 
And so we see that Jesus will decide with fairness, and he will look at the poor, and he will look the afflicted, and he will strike the earth, and he will slay the wicked. So the wicked will get their just desserts. And that is the, a, a beautiful thing. So hope when you look at that, it, it, it's, it's, it's sad, but it's also glorious for two reasons. One, it vindicates the justice and righteousness of God. That evil is ultimately, finally um, destroyed, punished. And we can use that verse from Romans 3 that you can say that these sins have been passed over. The sins of the wicked haven't been immediately um they haven't been immediately condemned to hell. And so God, at the end, vindicates his holiness and righteousness by judging all wickedness and evil. And two, it is glorious because we look at this, we look at that passages like that and they say, but by the grace of God, I am one of those afflicted ones. I wasn't smarter or wiser or more holy than these. I am wicked. But by God's grace, he has changed my heart of stone to heart of flesh. He has put his spirit within me and he has brought me into fellowship with himself through the atoning blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And so it is a glorious thing to see God be just in dealing with wickedness, but it's also a glorious thing to be reminded of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the grace of God shown to wicked men and women so that he can be just and justifier at the same time. So hopefully that's comforting to think about the justice of God to finally to close with a prayer from the Valley of Vision called The Great Discovery. Glorious God, I bless thee that I know thee. I once lived in the world but was ignorant of its creator, was partaker of thy providences but knew not the provider, was blind while enjoying the sunlight, was deaf to all things spiritual, with voices all around me, understood many things but had no knowledge of thy ways, saw the world but did not see Jesus only. O oh, happy day, when in thy love's sovereignty thou didst look on me and call me by grace. Then did the dead heart begin to beat, the darkened eye glimmer with light, the dull ear catch thy echo, and I turned to thee and found thee, O oh, God ready to hear, willing to save. Then did I find my heart at enmity to thee, vexing thy spirit. Then did I fall at thy feet and hear thee thunder, the soul that sinneth it must die. But when grace made me to know thee, and admire a God who hated sin, thy terrible justice held my will submissive. My thoughts were then as knives cutting my head. Then didst thou come to me in silken robes of love, and I saw thy son dying that I might live, and in that death I found my all. My soul doth sing at the remembrance of that peace. The gospel cornet brought a sound unknown to me before that reached my heart, and I lived, never to lose my hold on Christ or his hold on me. Grant that I may always weep to the praise of mercy found, and to tell others as long as I live that thou art a sin-pardoning God, taking up the blasphemer and the ungodly, and washing them from their deepest stain. Amen.